What's going on, Packers fans? Aaron Negler here, Cheesehead TV, joined by Packer Reports, Dara Karaher. Dara, how are you doing, man? I'm the very best, Aaron. How are you? Um, I'm always nervous about pronouncing your name because I know I'm going <laughs> to mess it up, but I've but gotten through it. it now and we're ready to roll on with winners and losers on the Packers roster after the draft. It's interesting. We spend so much time, right, leading up to the draft, dissecting prospects, talking about their fit and how they might work with the Packers, etc. But it does have consequences and or ripple effects throughout the roster. And uh, yesterday you put out a list of winners and losers throughout the the Green Bay Packers roster that I thought, hey, let's let's talk about that because I think it's an interesting idea. Um, first of all, let me get your thoughts on the draft before we get into the uh, roster itself because everybody's got you know some kind of opinion about oh they did a great job or oh they they kind of messed this up as far as value. Where do you stand on how Brian and company did on the draft over the weekend? Yeah, well, it felt to me very much business as usual. I mean, it was as Packers of a Packers draft as you're going to guess. <laughs> um, I like, I, I did like the approach overall. They did what they love to do, which is sort of triple up on a certain position of need. And, you know, hopefully you find one guy that sticks, which they did at safety this year. Um, I don't have a ton of opinions on Jordan Morgan. He's probably like the least polarizing player of the first round. I mean, it was maybe you could argue slightly higher than the consensus had him, but on the outside looking in, we don't really know. I mean, we don't know where the value actually lies for these guys in the league. They trade up, they trade down for a reason. They have much better sources than anyone outside the league can have. So I don't read into, you know, player value as much as other people might. So looking at the roster, um, we'll start with the, the losers the, of the winners and losers. We'll start with guys that maybe are going to have a little more competition than perhaps they expected, or, you know, just, outright might not make the squad we'll start with anthony johnson jr you have him listed uh as far as somebody who probably is thinking boy oh boy i got a bunch of competition now in this room what is your take there yeah well it, when, when you mention losers i mean i i can imagine the players just kind of hit the draft when you're in the nfl unless you're at a certain level like jair alexander or you know you're immune to being replaced I can imagine these guys dreading it. And frankly, Johnson Jr., it was worst case scenario this week. Um, the Packers go with Javon Bullard, Evan Williams, and Oladapo in, in the on day three, which that's really going to crowd out that room. I mean, he's probably not in any trouble of making the roster. It's, it's the guys below him that are in that trouble. But when you want to talk about playing time, he was he was maybe you know a candidate for starting this season, and that really doesn't seem like that's a possibility now with such a crowded room, especially a premium pick spent on on Javon Bullard. And then you go into the interior of the offensive line. You've listed Sean Ryan and Josh Myers. Interesting that you know Myers is a starter, has been his basically his entire career, but he is heading into the final year of his deal uh, without an extension. And then you look at Sean Ryan and we saw how he was mixed in throughout the season last year, especially down the stretch at right guard. What What's your take there on those two guys? Yeah, well, I think I got some backlash for not uh, including Rashid Walker in that in that trio. But um, in my opinion, the Packers are going to play their best five, and they do really like Rashid Walker. Um, I think, you know, when a push comes to shove, people get pushed around. Zach Tom's a great candidate for being starting at center this season. And that could uh, kick Myers out entirely if they fancy, you know, uh, Jordan Morgan at right tackle. I mean, of course, we know Elton Jenkins can play absolutely anywhere. So it, overall, it's going to be a net loss for everyone on the offensive line when you draft a first round offensive tackle who has you know, maybe four position versatility. So I wouldn't read into too much, you know, who has exactly lost more than others. But yeah, mm -hmm. I did end up going with Myers just for even what we heard pre-draft, pre uh, some rumors that, you know, the Packers really weren't set on Myers as starting center next season. And the same goes for Sean Ryan. He was probably thinking with John Runyon out of the fold that he was ready to take over as a full-time starting guard. He's going to have to fight for a starting position this season with with that group of guys in there, Monk and, and um, uh, Jordan Morgan. I think it's I think you're spot on actually about not including Walker there because I don't think for a second that you know anybody really expected them to come out of this draft without some competition for Walker. You know, there's no way that I think they were going to just set it and forget it for a former 7th rounder who yes had a nice stretch, no question about it at the end of the year, but you know, we heard Brian talk about competition all offseason. I I got to think he was expecting that this was coming. Um 
then you've listed Keyshawn Nixon, which I very much tend to agree, though it was fascinating to see Nixon take to Twitter yesterday talking about uh, don't think that I won't be on the field or something like that. I, he's clearly understanding what has happened here after this draft. Yeah, and it wasn't just him. It was a, a lot of guys that got on my back for uh, for including him. Listen, <laughs> the, this offseason is an overall net positive for Keyshawn Nixon. No doubt about it. He got a great, a very healthy contract for a starting slot corner. They changed the kickoff rules that will, that will greatly uh, increase his impact on special teams. But overall, on this weekend, the Packers have drafted three safeties, all of whom have played over 750 slot snaps in college. These guys are are pretty, um, you know, they're well-versed at not just safety at the slot. You can only play two safeties at a time. And we goodness knows Xavier McKinney's going to play just about every snap next season. So you're left with a very crowded room. And I mean, Nixon, yes, he's still going to start in the slot at the start of the season. But you think if he misses maybe two weeks with a little injury and he comes back and Javon Bullard's been falling out at slot, which mm-hmm. he did for a national championship winning Georgia team, caught interception in a national championship game. You know, it's not like the Packers don't have any candidates to replace Nixon in there. Now, yes, his contract will help him out in the long run and give him a bit of a benefit of the doubt. But when you're anytime you draft four defensive backs on in a draft, you know, you got, you got to be looking over your shoulder in that starting position. I agree. And look, that's pretty much what I said heading into the draft regarding Nixon, because they did hand him that contract. And I had a lot of people saying, well, that's set then. And I'm like, if you take Brian at his word about competition, you can fully expect some competition at that position. I don't doubt for a moment that they're going to throw that open in camp. And I know, like you say, the the contract certainly gives them some kind of stability, but I do not think there will be like any hesitation by the defensive staff to, you know, rotate some of these younger guys in early in camp and see who can a hold up and B maybe push Nixon. I think that's entirely possible. Um, Then you've listed AJ Dillon. I think this one, you know, makes some sense, but you know, he's obviously on a cheap contract. They brought him back because of his familiarity with the system. What are, what are your thoughts there on Dylan? Yeah, I just I just plugged him in near the end. I mean, he's he's probably still going to make the roster. I know Andy Herman has spoke a lot about how he's not a guarantee to make it, which is true. Um, Emmanuel Wilson's obviously a, a, a pretty big yeah. loser from this because he might not make the roster now. But um, in terms of Dylan, I think the fact that he's going to be losing carries pretty much obviously to Marshawn Lloyd because I mean the Packers are going to roll out Jake. Jacobs is obviously going to get a massive portion of carries if he can stay healthy this season so when you got to supplement in one of the best young passing games in the NFL with one of the most bell cow running backs in the league and Josh Jacobs and now you include a rookie uh, day two draft pick AJ Dillon's spots are going to be a little bit uh, limited this season a rookie day two pick who mirrors Josh Jacobs in a lot of ways. I agree. I think they're, they're going to feed this kid um, early to see, you know, what they have as far as can he hold up? Does he know the playbook? Can he hold up and pass pro Dylan is clearly, you know, familiar. And I think, you know, his days aren't numbered yet, but yeah. if the rookie looks good, there could easily be a shift, especially early on in the season. Um, switching it over, let's talk about some winners, shall we? Uh, start with Carrington Valentine. Where, where do you got Valentine as far as his competition with Stokes and his basic security in at least being in the rotation on defense? Yeah, well, Valentine and Stokes are both massive winners. Obviously, it's it's kind of wait and see on Stokes in his fifth year option. There's an outside chance that the Packers pick it up in the in the upcoming week. But for Valentine, I mean, we heard Brian Gutekind uh, praising him, praising him after the draft. I mean, everyone and their mother seemed to be uh, mocking <laughs> Terry and Arnold's and Kula McKinstry's to the Packers. Right. And luckily, it just seems like Carrington Valentine has managed to dodge and weave every single one of these players. And <laughs> I mean, he looks maybe primed to be starting out an outside cornerback slot, which is insane for a seventh round pick last year, going to a team that had you know, Rasul Douglas, Jair Alexander, and Eric Stokes on the roster at that point. Like, who would have thought we would get, be talking about him? Corey Ballantyne as well, also, he's going to be a winner. Just the simple fact that they waited until the seventh round to pick a corner. And I like Caden King. I think he can, can be something. He's kind of... a, a pick that's breeding similar excitement to Anthony Johnson Jr. last year 
and uh, I would be leaning towards Keelan King makes, makes the roster. But, um, I mean, as far as the starters go, it's it's going to be Jair Alexander and Karen Valentine, unless Eric Stokes has some kind of massive resurgence this year, which is on the cards, but but pretty unlikely. And then you look at Bo Melton and Malik Heath. Uh, clearly, young pass catchers. You did wonder if they would go wide receiver at any point in this draft. They legit passed on that position. Uh, what are you seeing there for those two? Yeah, well, it's, it was already a crowded receiver room, I think. One more third or fourth round pick would have been the nail in the coffin for for Bo Melton, maybe you know, in in this. But listen, the it looks like the receiving uh, core we had last year is pretty much going to stay the exact same way it was. That's massive news for Melton. Um, it's massive news for all of those guys because they're they're seemingly quite safe now. I don't know if Grant Dubose will will manage to sneak his way onto the roster this year. We'll see. But uh, yeah, anytime you come out of the draft knowing that your team hasn't picked anyone at your position, you're probably going to be quite happy. Speaking of not picking anyone at their position, you got Tyler Davis and Ben Sims. Uh, the Davis thing is interesting because he is coming back from an injury and you never really know how guys are going to progress initially. Uh, are they going to take a while to round into shape? How do you see those two fitting in on the roster this year without anybody kind of pushing them from the draft class? Yeah, um, they did draft a, or they did sign a UDFA a tight end who's gathered some buzz. But overall, I think these guys are going to be pretty happy that they don't have to. They don't have a you know another surefire tight end to make the roster. Last year, Tyler Davis had to contend with uh, Kraft and Musgrave, who were obviously both going to be locks uh, being day two picks. So uh, these guys will be quite happy. I mean, uh, Kraft and Musgrave were in no threat, obviously, but. Yeah, it, it's a group that clearly Matt LaFleur and the team are very pleased with, and there's big things expected of, of a young group going forward. Really appreciate the time, Dara. You can find his work there at the link in the description of this video over at Packer Report. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's a real honor.